you're staying awake. So this is the last panel of today, today, and I'm here together with three prominent tech investors, Sergio and the two Olas. So, um, <laughs> so um, I think if you remember that picture book started to say that the the Nordic is being a proven tech hub for building sustainable companies, um, and. They gave, he gave examples of different unicorns that has been growing out of the Nordic region. But in the latest development, uh, what do you expect happens for these tech companies, in particular in the Nordics? Uh, Ola, at the end, uh, Pamela, what do you what do you say? Let's that? start with the crystal ball, basically. Yes. Easy, easy <laughs> questions. Um, but I think it's 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 a remarkable. Um, I mean, if you look at the Nordic region and if you look at tech. Um, it's always been punching well above its weight. And I think this is actually accelerating. We have um, we have produced several unicorns, um, and unicorns tend to feed um, other inventions that come around. And I must say, it's really impressive to see this. And I think it's also been accelerating recently because you have had uh, these tech inventions very early on go global. Um, and I think a huge benefit of of being in a small home market like the Nordics is that you have to look outside incredibly quickly. And by doing that, you can actually reach scale uh, very fast. So I do think there's a very good opportunity to see this trend continuing. And also, once you create the wealth of some of these unicorns, before we mentioned Spotify, uh, Klarna, and, and other big um, companies of this nature, that also feeds a lot of wealth around it that will be reinvested back into uh, the society. And people will also be looking at these success stories and say, I can do exactly the same thing. And it's just impressive to meet very young entrepreneurs who have absolutely no fear, um, who think they can conquer the world, and the ambition that this has created. Others have been successful, we can do the same. I must say I'm very positive on this. I think uh, it's, it's going to accelerate. And uh, the other Ola, what do you think about, in the recent development, what about the valuations now for tech companies? What do you see for the past? I mean, when we read, read for this for this panel, we read that in the introduction text that the IPO market was said to be strong. But it, you know, we've heard already from other panels that the the IPO market is closed. So, so what does that mean? <laughs> no, but I think I mean agreeing with the with the previous panel. I, I definitely think the IPO market is closed at least for now, and I think most of our companies agree. And I can't remember who said it, but in the same way, we're we're not advising our companies to spend time on IPOs either. Mm -hmm. um, M and A market is different, um, and I think it, it follows the the fundraising market quite closely as well. Where yes, it's challenging, and everyone is looking at valuations. A lot of our co-investors are taking a very drastic view and looking at everything that's kind of even agreed um, pre-Christmas or or, or pre-December. Um, we're potentially a little bit more kind of forgiving on pre-December valuations, but for the new stuff, we, we think about it in the same way. Um, what I think is true is that even if it's challenging, there's a lot of dry powder out there. There's a lot of companies that still manage to get good valuation, but I think there's a certain flight to, to quality. And I think for Nordic assets, that actually works quite well. I think the quality of the Nordic assets we see are, I mean, it's difficult to compare and to, uh, uh, to generalize, but overall, there's a very high quality of assets, um, which I think is helpful in this market. I think the other thing happening as well is that you have kind of an emergence towards very small assets where people tend to go earlier and earlier, or later and later. And the Nordic market has a quite young but interesting cohort of companies, a lot of them coming out from, from the Klarna's of the world. Mm. So I think in, in the market we're going into, um, on a relative basis, it probably works to the benefit of the Nordics. And Sergio, what do you, what do you say? Do you I, I, I think the point has been made previously, but I, I would really make a distinction between, between the public and the private markets. Um, as, as we've all seen, the public markets react pretty quickly, the private markets Take, take time to adjust and what really happens in, in times of uncertainty like, like, like we are experiencing right now and like we've experienced during COVID is that uh, new, new deals tend to slow down slightly uh, but expectations in terms of valuations take quite, quite a bit of time to adjust. Um, so, you know, it was debated before whether this situation will be similar to COVID when we saw uh, obviously the markets uh, and, you know, f for all of us, I think, uh, the, the months post lockdown have been probably the busiest, at least in tech investing, that we've seen in a very long time. Uh, will it be the same now? I think it's, it's way too early to tell. Uh, what I'm seeing in the market right now is that people are 
at least for tech investments, quality tech investments are still behaving, I want to say business as usual, but are still um, leaning forward. Um, obviously, aside from the human tragedy, if, if the economic situation and the inflation that has, has been discussed uh, persists for a long time, then that's when I think we'll see valuations starting to adjust. So more opportunities, basically. More opportunities at the moment, for sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, and when relations are just, it does create opportunities as well. So I think there's no lack of opportunities, no lack of capital. It's more about taking, taking some... So, um, it's, it's more about asset selection, in my mind. Yeah, so, so you also agree to the quality aspect that the two of us just mentioned. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get used to that. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's just too funny. <laughs> but, but, but I think the topic of asset selection, I think, was quite interesting as well, is that you have, well, it depends a little bit in, on your setup, obviously, but more and more, more classic private market venture investors yeah. actually looking at public opportunities. And yeah. quite a few of the interesting opportunities we could see last year are now suddenly public and trading at you know 70% discount to when we thought it was an interesting case last year. Uh, and that's, you know, that's worth thinking about. Would that include that you would actually think about doing public to private, as, 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 as Mr. Deutsche Bank suggested? Uh, probably not. I mean, <laughs> I mean we, we obviously hold both public and, and private assets, as I'm sure anyone familiar with Chinavik uh, is aware of. And, and you know, we, um, we take a view in both public, public and private markets. And uh, it's been a clear dominance in, in private historically. That's where we've seen a lot of our successes. But you know, a lot of the value creation we've seen historically has come from you know, Salando in the public markets, from um, Livongo in the IPO and, 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 and the trade thereafter. So uh, we look at both. It doesn't mean we're going to do uh, take privates. <laughs> Oh, we, see, we see a huge opportunity in, in, in tech privates. I think it's one of the biggest dislocations we've seen in a while. And um, if, you if you look at the private environment, it tends almost to be a lagger here because if you hold a very nice private company, as we said before, the quality of the portfolio tends to be quite nice. We don't see a lot of changes in the underlying performance of the businesses. Um, what you do see is a massive change and shift in the valuation. So if you are in a private context, you're, you tend to be called this, we tend to live in the, either the 2021 illusion or you are in the 2022 reality. Uh, and I think we, today, we almost have to forget 2021. Uh, that was the peak of the peak and we have to adjust the new valuation environment. The public market is way more brutal this way. They will judge you every day um, and this creates opportunities. Because you have companies who want to be on the fourth foot, they want to do the things, but before they had the public currency to do these things. And today, they do not have the public currency to do the same actions they took before. So if you take from a venture capital or private equity perspective, there's a really big opportunity to actually come in at a much more decent valuation here. Not to say that this is easy, but we see that the trend that you saw towards IPOs will shift towards the trend towards public to privates. The, 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 the one thing I would say about public to privates, and we, we, as Inflection, I, I was directly involved, we, we did one in, in Norway actually last year taking private a business called Infront. Um, and you know, by no means it's, it's an easy process. You have, you know, as you all know, many, many different stakeholders that you need to convince and, uh, and, and the markets in the last place. Um, but what I would say, having sort of been involved in public to private in, in the Nordics and in, in the UK, it's actually a pretty friendly uh, a relatively straightforward environment from a regulatory perspective, uh, whereas in the UK you have a lot of sort of additional complexity. Put ups and shut ups and exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I thought that was actually a pretty smooth process. It's actually, it's actually one of the one of the friendliest markets. It's incredibly buyer friendly, yeah. and also um, one thing it does it also protects the companies because if a transaction doesn't happen, very often it doesn't leak. Um, it yeah. doesn't actually not get out, which means you protect the company in case people do not know it's been in play. So it creates a very, very unique environment. It's very similar across all the Nordic countries and, and dissimilar to the United States and the UK. Oh, I can only echo that as a lawyer, as a capital markets lawyer and public M&A <laughs> lawyer. Uh, the, I, I was taught years back from an old banker that uh, public M&A is actually the diamond of M&A. So, because it's so exciting um, working with, but as investors, it's probably not as exciting as us, for us investors. I thought you meant it's the highest fee paying. That's what yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um, but, but to the trend of you being tech advisors, uh, when we're listening to the other panels, they, they all also talk about tech. Could you actually, Sergio, be a tech advisor now? What, what does that, in, what does that def define for you? Yeah, yeah, you can. I mean, you mean a tech investor? Or, yes. Yeah. Yes. I, 
I, th I think you, you can be a tech, definitely can be a, so obviously tech is everywhere and we've heard it you know, and, and seen it in all, in all sectors. Um, you can definitely be a tech investor, but I think tech investor has become a, a way to general term. Mm. So I think all of us now sort of within our respective firms uh, don't think about tech investing at, at, at that level, but we really think about sectors and subsectors within tech. Uh, so, you know, at the most basic level, you have, you know, software, you have, you know, data and analytics, you have tech services, but then you need to really bring it one level down and, and you, you really need to sort of build expertise in specific subsectors to be relevant and competitive. Mm. Uh, because if, you know, if you want to invest in fintech, that, that also is too high level. You need to go down into payments, you need to go down into wealth tech, into, you know, core banking software. You, you need to bring it at that level. Mm. So I think like, like, like anything, our, our industry is going towards more specialization and, and that's happening in, in tech investing. So Ola, what, do you, what, are, what are your specialties within Shinovic? What subsectors within tech? No, no, smiling when you're saying that because we, we always used to position ourselves as one of Europe's leading tech investors and I think we now position ourselves as one of Europe's leading growth investors, which okay. I, you know, I think it says quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and we obviously, you know, we started in e-commerce and marketplaces, which has been the core of, well, we didn't start there. We obviously started with, with a lot of things historically, as, as most people would know, but our tech adventure started in, in e-commerce and marketplaces. Um, we now also focused on um, financial technology and business services, which is the team that I head up, and we have a big healthcare team. Um, in the Nordics, we have a team that goes slightly broader, slightly earlier, and you know, we to, to your question about you know, can everything be tech? We we invested in ice creams last year, which <laughs> is, is you know. Well, it's ice cream tech, I guess, but, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so tech is becoming a very, very broad definition, but I think Sergio's point is right. When you, you find your, your themes, you find your subsectors, you find your expertise, uh, and, and that becomes something you can go quite deep in and you can kind of layer out from there. And at, at some point you look at the next one, but, but to cover tech is impossible yeah. and to define yourself to only doing what people traditionally regard as, as pure tech, um, it's probably not the right strategy either. And Ola, do you, what, what, um what type of subsectors have you been? You, are you focusing on? But I think maybe asking the question different. I think tech is all about disruption. So basically, you're disrupting ways. Uh, we, we heard from a previous speaker talking about ways to monitor patients in tech in ways we couldn't do before, and the inventions you see are just remarkable. I think we're talking about you know inventions that changes this and drives growth in a completely different way. Down. So we almost flip it around and say, tech is a hygiene factor. Mm -hmm. And it's about finding growth vectors. So you're really finding where tech can actually drive growth. And that's where you, those are the themes you tend to invest behind. And these themes are absolutely not static. They change almost all the time. And we have to reinvent ourselves consistently. I mean, if you looked at back in the 2000s, you talked about electronics, then it was telecom, then it was media, then it became SaaS business, marketplaces, and cybersecurity. And it, it all evolved. And then it comes health tech and environmental tech. So um, f for us, it's more finding business model that have strong growth characteristics, often repeatable business models. So one thing we, we do like about tech is once you're in it and once you have it, usually they are on a subscription model, which is a very attractive model, which creates a lot of stickiness. So we're more looking for the features, maybe rather than just saying a certain subsector, and look for these characteristics and commonalities across. So it's not necessarily the answer to your question, but really looking for, for, for different ways of finding growth and, uh, and really that stickiness. We think one of those most attractive parts of, of, of uh, the tech-enabled businesses. And what is the sector that you are most attracted to now? I mean, I think one of the themes, I mean, really security. Yeah, so cybersecurity. Cybersecurity, security of all forms. Um, and I mean, we just made three investments over the last four months in mm. both large and small in, in security. And, and this will accelerate. Um, security before was probably something you dealt with just for, for the select few. It was about email, it was about intrusion in the building. Today, security is about so many more things that you cannot imagine. It's brand theft, it's about stealing by IP, different ways you have to protect. So we think that's a very, that's one example and a very, very interesting theme. But you also still have, you know, disruptive ways. We talked about marketplaces before, how, how buyers and sellers meet in a completely different ways. And, and COVID has been probably the most exciting accelerator of, of technical disruption that we've seen. When, when my mother, who's 87 years old, began to buy online, and you understand the <laughs> benefit of that, you're never going to go back. Mm. And these behaviors have really set off a completely different motion that we could ever foresee before. So marketplaces is one area, and I know you've been big investors in that as well. 
do you recognize that Ola? new new customers in the, in the in in that type of sectors uh, the result of COVID? well new customers new sectors but also new models with the same customers in the same sectors i think it's been an absolute acceleration in a lot of ways and it, and it goes deeper than that i mean we, we we talk a lot about enablers so you might have the same marketplace model but then you have everything in terms of new payment methodologies new anti-fraud detection to the security point um, new delivery methods so there's so much happening around those models as well which is mm. kind of new in itself and it, it goes back to the thematic approach you you find one what an e-commerce model and what comes out of that in terms of security payments delivery um that's where we see a lot of opportunities mm. and cyber security sergio do you also see that as a growing area yes i, I say probably f f for us two main sort of buckets one one which cyber security would fall into which is sort of new hot i want to say hot security is a new hot trend because it's been around now for a while but sort of these trends addressing big big needs cyber is one uh you know completely different but banking as a service is another one where you try to embed financial services into apps and and, and the likes um so, so i think that's one sort of more um one category the second category for me is um in investing in software and tech for industries that are behind the curve in terms of digitization and so we've seen a lot of activity over the last, you know, years and months in, uh, you know, places like construction software, supply chain software, yeah. you know, obviously healthcare being a big, big theme. So, so those for me are the two, two main buckets. Yeah. Um, and on the previous panels, there was also talk about these global tech, uni tech unicorns that could emerge as consolidators themselves. Do you see them as competitors, or are you afraid of them, or could you could really compete? Be able to compete with them. What do you say, Ola? Uh, I think it's a bit. Of, well, me, I can just say Ola and someone. Yeah. <laughs> you took yeah. it twice now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you take <laughs> <laughs> that. You, you can say all the things I forget, which probably would be most of it. Um, no, but uh, I think it's. I think you're on a disadvantage sitting there as well because I. <laughs> I'm back. Um, no, I, I think it's both. Um, of course, the competition and they actually tend to drive up valuations a fair amount uh, in some of the rounds we see. Then on the other hand, um, they add a lot of strategic value quite often um, they might be a quite good exit route for you um, and, and they're quite increasingly so talented co-investors that are quite quite thoughtful a lot of them have you know ended up there either by a need to diversify and, and, and deploy cash for some of the more mature ones I think PayPal is, is a good example yeah. of that yeah. um, and you also have others that, that you know have a genuine need of acquiring good technology um, regardless of what the motivations are I think they're, they're welcome as, as both you know co-investors and, and potential acquirers hmm. do you agree <laughs> um, no jokes. Uh, I, I actually do, and I, in many ways, don't view them necessarily as, uh, you know, as, as compared to in that sense. I mean, they, they are, they also need partners. They also need capital, and so on. All the, despite being, you know, unicorns and huge consolidators, they, they um, very often need additional capital and need partnership, and it can be combinations and spin-offs, etc. So. You know, we view it as a very good compl complement. And quite frankly, then, it's talking about a lot of spin-offs from these companies that come up and new inventions come up. So we view it as a, as a real positive, not as a negative. Well, maybe just adding a slightly different perspective, I think the role of M&A, I guess, for us as, as investors, uh, it's obviously a key lever in, in what we do. So if I think about our investments at inflection, probably a third of the value creation comes from M&A. Mm. And I think that's particularly true in, 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 in the Nordics and in Europe, even more so than in the US, where you have this large sort of market that you can address. In Europe, obviously, it's very regional, and you need to use M&A to enter um, or build positions. Um, so, so yeah, so you, you obviously have consolidators competing, but I think we have a lot of our own portfolio companies actually trying to pursue that strategy. Mm. Maybe, I mean, one thing to add to that, I think there's, there's another group of, kind of unicorns as well, because we've been talking a lot about the consolidators. What we see increasingly as well is that, especially given last year's valuation levels, you had quite a few relatively young and proven and, and typically non-profitable unicorns who now, you know, find themselves in a world where they need to kind of grow into the valuation they achieved by scale, or they need to find a slightly more cash generating model. I think quite a few of them are using the valuation marks they achieved last year or the, yeah. or the cash they raised last year um, to um, acquire their way into, into scale. That's an interesting, it's an interesting new trend. Uh, and, and 
do you see any differences in acquiring pure tech versus acquiring kind of more embedded tech? So more the the uh, the tech companies that in you know, customers and brands. Ola. Can you specify your question a bit more? <laughs> <laughs> the valuations of these two yeah. types of tech companies. Do you see is a big difference or is? I, I don't really think there's the good evidence of that, to be honest. So I I, uh, I think it's. You know, the, the way that companies tend to be valued, you see almost two bookends of the spectrum. One of the ones who have, you know, really strong hyper growth and, and good unit economics. And you can talk about the you know, rule of 40, 50, 60, 80, and you can see 50 to 100% growth where you can, but still solid unit economics. That's one bookend of the spectrum. And then you see the one who have slightly lower growth, but actually are profitable. Um, that's the other book in the spectrum, or a certain set of valuation. And, and that's sort of what we see more drive, the different business models and the different valuation types. And, um, and probably today, in today's environment, where you see valuations being reset, you, you would expect that companies are raised at a certain benchmark before do not want to raise the lower benchmark. They're going to be probably applied more to profitability today uh, to actually prove that business model out, um, because they do not want to be caught up in the, in the, in the valuation downward spiral, if you will. And, um, and you can also see probably shorter fundraising cycles, uh, because if, you, if your valuations now are coming down, you do not want to dilute yourself as much in, this, in the next iteration round. So we would expect also to be shorter and, and, and actually uh, not, as, uh, not as large as they were before. Do you agree, Sergio, to Olaf's comments? Oh, absolutely. I, th I think, I mean, th th this whole trend uh, um, and some, some of the pressure on valuations, particularly for the high growth, unprofitable companies, it started well before the today's situation started, probably at the beginning of the year, end of last year. So I'd say there is something perhaps a little bit more structural that people are thinking about. How can I sort of prove my business model? Um, because the market might not always be there to, to, sort of to, um, to command these, these valuations just, just purely based on growth. So I'm just looking at the floor. Is there any questions from the floor? Well, I always have a question. Great, Gabriel. <laughs> thank you for saying. How big of a headache on a scale of one to five? How big of a headache is inflation and interest rate rate hikes for all of you? It's a big, it's a big headache. Um, I mean, it could be both a positive and a negative headache. I mean, inflation, if you sit on a lot of leverage, can be a good thing. Um, but also, um, the biggest driver here is the downward pressure on valuations, quite frankly. So to predict this is, is very, very difficult. Um, and I think the only thing you can do is to do what's in your control. And what's in your control is to control the performance of your companies. Make sure that you invest in the A-plus assets, strong growth characteristics, and do that work. But it is a real worry, and I think it also puts a lot of the pressure on capital structure again making sure you have the right capital structure. <laughs> Very little to add to that, to be honest. I mean, it's, as you say, it's, it's a big headache, and I, I think it further, further underpins the trend, I think all of us have been talking about, about a certain flight to quality and importance of, of finding right assets where I think valuations will hold. For anything that's not seen as A plus assets, I think you, you will see more pressure than before. I echo, I echo that. I, but, I also just, but also, just to add one thing, I mean, if, you, if you take Russia, for example, I mean, if you look at the energy dependency, huge topic, I don't think, we've probably just seen the beginning of where this is going to pan out. It can be a push to renewable energies that we haven't seen before because of this trend. Um, and, um, and you can also see, if you look at some of the raw material prices and transportation issues we'll have with these disruptions, which causes enormous flows if you, if you ship things from Asia to Europe and to the United States, for example. So. These are all very complex and intertwined issues that we have to think about sort of as, as investors and owners of global businesses. So, and with that, I think we should wrap it up and just uh, thank all the panelists thank for you. the insightful.